Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're continuing with the Septandy theme. Yes, it's still September. And inside this box is a Tandy or TRS-80 machine donated by viewer Seth. And I think it needs a little bit of a repair. Hopefully it will not be a super long drawn out repair and this can be a somewhat quick video. But you know, I call my super mini mail call videos mini and yet they're still like 40 minutes long half the time. The last couple videos I made, which are on the TRS-80 Model 1, they were about 50 minutes each, and I tried my darndest to edit those down for length so they weren't super long. Anyhow, hopefully this one won't be as long, but you never know. So if you like long videos, put that down below, but if you don't, put that down below as well. I'm always curious to know if I should really be cutting these videos to much shorter length or keeping them long format. Anyhow, without further ado, let's get right to it and open up this box. I always got to hand it to Seth. I really like the boxes he puts together. And uh, just here for the king cake, he always puts this on here. There will be a video upcoming, maybe it's already up by the time you see this, where he sent me a whole bunch of king cake related stuff. But in the past, Seth has actually sent in a king cake all the way from New Orleans for me. He overnighted it to me here in Portland so I could enjoy some absolutely delicious king cake. I'll put a link in the description below if you're unfamiliar with what that's all about, but of course it relates to Mardi Gras. Uh, anyways, there's king cakes on all three sides and lots of subtandies. Let's see what's inside of this. I haven't done any unboxing videos on the main channel in quite a while because of course, super mini mail calls are normally on the second channel now. I made that switch a good number of years ago, but since it's subtandy, I'm making an exception here. Knowing Seth, he has probably packed this box with packing material that is not just foam or whatever. It's probably got who knows what candy and stuff like that. And yeah, look <laughs> right off the bat, I have an unlimited supply of Harry Bow ginger lemons. That's awesome. All right, looks like we got smaller packages inside the bigger packages. So let's undo all of this here. This here says IO panel. I gotta say, I'm thankful for uh, the labels because you never know with packing material, I might just accidentally throw something away that needs to be saved. All right, there it is. This is the computer and it says 4P on it. So what this is, is a TRS-80 4P. Well, this is an example of how to pack something so it can survive shipping. If you bought this from a regular seller on eBay, they probably would have just thrown the computer with like a sheet of bubble wrap in a box and hope for the best. And it would of course been smashed along the way. This thing on the other hand has so much bubble wrap. I am gonna say there's a really good chance that this thing has survived the journey unscathed. Let me extricate it from all this bubble wrap. So what we have here is a TRS-80 Model 4P. This is compatible with the Model 1 and the Model 3 and the Model 4. And this is Radio Shack's attempt to make a very small and compact portable, and I'm gonna put portable in quotes, machine that's just a lot easier to move around than the Model 4 is. The Model 4 and the Model 3 have the same form factor, and I've had videos on my channel about both those machines. They have a 12 inch integrated monitor, the keyboard is fixed, a couple full height disk drives, the whole computer is relatively big. And of course, because the keyboard's attached and all that, it's just, you, you need a big desk. This on the other hand, I have to admit, it's pretty cool how small it is. We have a nine inch CRT, two half height disk drives, built in power switch and some controls for the monitor. Of course, the keyboard, like I showed, is integrated in. There is a front cover, which he has sent separately. It's over here on the side. And it's got this creamy beige color, which, uh, well, this thing has seen a lot of sunlight, I guess, because it's pretty yellowed. Condition-wise, I gotta say, this thing is in really nice shape. Uh, we have a couple discs in there that were in backwards as sort of like a, a protector. Inside this bubble wrap is the front cover. Let me extricate this so we can take a look at how that looks. And that is the front cover. And look, it's got little dimples here. So obviously if this is installed on the front, it's designed to have the computer sat down on this, which will obviously protect everything in the front there. So it has some metal clasps on each side that are riveted on, and there are some metal hooks on the sides of the computer where that can connect to. There's actually a little bit of space in here. It says manual right there and diskette right there. So I guess you could store your, your boot disks 
And we got something here, which uh, not sure what this is. We'll take a look at that in a second. Nice attention to detail. There's a little groove around the outside here where you can store your power cord. Judging by the yellowing on the one side of this, this obviously goes on like this. Let's hook on the clasps. There we go. This here must be a little expansion slot cover for the back of the computer because it says uh, certified to comply with class B limits, product of the USA. I, I'm assuming there's, there's an expansion header on the back or something that this would go on. But this is my first time looking at this, so I think that's kind of cool. This appears to be a carry handle with a little robotic uh, spring-loaded metal arm there. That is pretty cool. Also, it says TRS-80 Model 4P Personal Computer. Awesome. Looking at the back of the computer here, we have the RS-232 port, we have a parallel printer connector, and we have an IO bus connection there. This obviously covers that up. If you are not normally using the IO bus, you wanna have this cover on there. And it's interesting because the FCC labels there are actually written right here on there as well. I always see right here, they printed very nicely push here to release the handle. That is a very nice design. You can push on either side, which is a lot easier than what I was doing when I was trying to get it out. You just get it out like that. Nice. Seth sent this separately wrapped as well. It says IO port cover, which is a little plastic piece that will go on there somehow. Oh, like that, okay. And I can see here that it has a metal rod. So this is obviously hinged. Oh, look at that on the inside. So this is model number 26-1080 and serial number is only 6,561. Pretty low there on the grand scheme of things. Some would say this was Radio Shack's last ditch effort to keep the TRS-80 model line alive. And I don't know how well this thing sold, but I don't think it really sold that well because I think by the time this thing came out, PCs were firmly established as like the business type of computers and CPM machines, which this can run, were basically falling by the wayside at that point. I'm not gonna actually try to attach this right now. It might be brittle plastic, but it looks like it kind of hooks on like this and then you would flip it down and it's got two clips right here that would clip in there and there just to keep all the ports nice and hidden. But probably if you're gonna use any of these things regularly, it's probably best just to take this off. Let's take a look at the letter here. Seth writes, welcome to box two, the Septandi box. And uh, yeah, there are other boxes from Seth right now that I haven't opened, so I'm kind of doing it out of order, just, uh, well, you know, it's September and all that. This box contains the item I'm most excited to submit this round. So you'll see that I have done my best to repack it in a much more secure way than it was sent to me originally. Well, yes, definitely that is the case. There's something like 50 feet of foam and 200 feet of bubble. So I hope you can reuse the packing materials for other shipments. I there are two Septandi items in this box, but I want to provide some notes, comments on the big item, the Model 4P. It took a little troubleshooting to get it power on, and I want to share those steps with you. I had a great time having this on my own desk for a few days, and I'm excited to send something in that mostly works. I did notice the CRT tube needs some tuning adjustment, but the white phosphor is just beautiful. Please note the discs are inserted backwards for shipping and they must be removed, that's right. Seth says he didn't know the Model 4P reads the ROM at power on. I guess I didn't know that either. I've never used a, a Model 4P, so I didn't know that. Now here's a weird one. Seth says, when I first tried to power on the unit, it was literally dead. The previous owner told me this would happen if the discs were not properly inserted with both levers locked on both drives. Once I followed these instructions, the unit powered right up and it freaking worked, <laughs> the PH. And I had a couple of very fun days in Model 4P land. Hoping that providing these steps to you will save you spending the same two days I did trying to figure out what was wrong with the unit. Well, I gotta say, I've never heard of anything like that. Let me open this up again. I have never heard of needing to have the disk drives latched to get something to turn on. That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. I'm thinking that there's a fault with the power supply on this thing and it, it couldn't possibly be related to the uh, floppy drives here. On the next page, Seth says he has separately wrapped the IO port cover and the front cover. They're both very fragile and didn't want to risk them breaking. Thanks very much, they both survived perfectly. And then he goes on to say that the Tandy microcomputer enclosed definitely does not work. Thank you, Seth. Um, what's this here that you sent along? Um, a little pin there, let's, let's open this up. It's like there's a staple holding this all together. Uh, looks like a message for you 
This looks like a business card of sorts for probably what's in the little bag here. It looks like this comes from Micro Micro Muse, which I guess is who made this stuff here. Let's take a look. Looks like we have an HP pin. This is the kind you would uh, stick to your shirt or your lapel or something like that. Oh, and it looks like we have a little tiny Apple II. How freaking cool is this? And a little monitor, it's a little Sanyo monitor that can sit on there. And then we have two disk drives as well. <laughs> I gotta say, this is really quite cool. Oh, look at this. Oh, monitor sideways. There we go. I know it's uh, maybe not in focus, but there it is in focus there. Looks like it's running Load Runner on the screen too. Absolutely freaking adorable. Very cool. All right, let's take a look at what's in these package. I'm assuming one of these is the uh, little Tandy microcomputer. This is it, the Tandy microcomputer, micro color computer. I think it's called the MC10. Well, I don't immediately see MC10 on here, but it just says microcolor computer 26-3011 and the serial number is 218,000. So relatively high up there and it takes AC 8 volts. Hmm, don't know if I have that kind of an input. Now, from my understanding, this thing is basically a TRS-80 color computer in here, except it has just 4K of memory and then it has this, um, well, you know, not so great keyboard. But yeah, this is an interesting little computer. I think it's really designed to compete with like the ZX Spectrum in the UK and the Timex Sinclair. They are really inexpensive side of computers. But of course, this does have the same color capabilities as the Coco. So it's like, you know, 16 colors, sort of text mode, hybrid weirdness. So anyhow, we're gonna shelve this for now. We'll focus on the 4P. All right, so the first thing I wanna check out is this strange power on condition where you supposedly have to have the disk drives closed. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I just plugged the mains into the back and I have both disk drives unlatched. Let's see what happens here. Okay, so that actually did come on. <laughs> now the computer's probably not going to actually do anything like yeah, it's, we don't see anything on screen which is very normal for these computers because I think we have to hold down the brake key on the keyboard here, turn it on or, or do the reset. And that's probably what is needed or maybe, I don't know. That's the way it works on the other models like the uh, TRT Model 3, you don't actually get anything on the screen at all unless you hold down brake. Uh, let's reset here. Hmm. It's trying to boot. Let's try putting in this TRS DOS disk here. Let's stick that in there and reset. The fact that this came on, there it goes, it is actually loading up without any issue. Let's see if we actually get anything on here. Now this might be what Seth was talking about with the ROM, that there is no way to break out into, a, into basic, for instance. They might have just done away with basic entirely and you entirely rely on that. Although it looks like it booted up and yet um, we don't have anything on the screen. So that's a little disheartening. Hmm. Now in this disc box, I actually have some floppy disks for the Model 4 and the Model 4P is completely compatible with the 4, at least as far as I understand. So let me find my Model 4 CPM disk which should be in here. Here it is, Model 4 CPM. Let's, uh, let's see what happens with this, a CPM Plus. Hit the reset button. I'm wondering if the CRT got damaged in shipping here, which is why this is uh, no longer working. And you know what? It didn't even boot at all off that CPM disc, which is bit strange. I'm going to shut this off and I'm going to go find some other Model 3 discs that I know work. We'll see if that does anything on here. All right, here are the discs I had upstairs. They were with my Model 3. I don't have any more Model 4 discs. Now, I'm thinking that the reason why it didn't turn on for Seth actually had nothing to do with the floppy drives. I mean, although maybe, why don't I close this one just for fun? <laughs> uh, it doesn't appear to actually be booting either. Yeah, this is interesting. Maybe I'm just, um, well, certainly sounds like it's trying to boot. 
I'm thinking that the power supply in this probably has a little bit of a dodgy cap situation. It's pretty typical on the TRS 80s. And uh, that means that it won't always turn on right away, or it might take like a few minutes to turn on because the little reservoir cap that runs the switch mode power supply controller has issues. Now it is kind of weird because I don't seem to be really getting much out of this machine at all. And of course the one that seemed to work the best was this original disc that was in here, this TRS DOS disc. Let's just try that one again. But even with this disc, we weren't even getting anything on screen at all. So like I said, I wonder if there's no high voltage. Yeah, it's, it's seeking. So this is doing the most and yet nothing. I'm gonna try one of the easiest fixes in the book. Let's see if we can use a cleaning floppy on this drive. It doesn't sound like it's making any horrible noises like uh, clunking or you know head banging, although this is a PC type disk drives and they don't do the head bang. Let's just see if that helps it boot a little bit more. All right, let's get that out of there. All right, let's put in a disc, which I think is a boot disc, maybe. It's one of my discs from upstairs. Doesn't seem to be doing anything at this point. Hmm, this computer's definitely behaving a little oddly. So this here is the Spectrum Analyzer app that I have used in the past to see if things are working. And I'm gonna say right now that the CRT in this is not running at all. I'd be seeing a peak right around 15 kilohertz if the CRT, if the CRT was working. And you know what? I just bumped the screen and the computer sort of reset and now we have something on the screen. And sure enough, we have the peak there. So that started up. So that's interesting. And uh, yeah, the CRT seems a little on the tired side. Obviously I have a dodgy connection in there and interesting is that didn't boot. So why don't we try the old brake key again here? I can see. Now it's beeping at me. This thing is acting very strange. I can see, oh wait, look, we have a clock there. <laughs> so that's something, a clock? <laughs> Boy, this machine is mysterious to me. Uh, <laughs> it starts loading off the disc and then it just sits there. And then now it's displaying 30 minutes and two seconds. So that's like there's some kind of real time clock. All right, enough of my fiddling around. I think it's time to open this thing up. I did a little brief inspection and it looks like there are four screws, two on each side here. And I have a feeling the whole computer slides out of the shell. So let me remove these screws here, which is gonna expose the, the white creamy color of the plastic underneath there. And let's figure out exactly how hard it is to service a 4P. Now, of course, this is a Radio Shack machine, so it's gonna have a good service manual. They were really good with all of their service manuals, at least uh, in the 80s they were, in the 70s. So I fully expect that there will be no difference with this machine. Okay, so I'm just gonna move the keyboard out of the way. It looks like it's permanently attached. I wonder if there's any screws on the bottom here. Not that I can necessarily tell. There's a piece of foam in there. I think that's supposed to be there. I don't see any extra screws. I do see what looks like the computer that should be able to slide out of there. There are the little button latch things here that maybe this has to come off. Let me find the appropriate screwdriver for this job. Well, I took that off and a nut fell inside. So I really don't think that that was supposed to come out. No, I'm gonna have to fix that after the fact. <laughs> With the machine on its front here, there is like a kickstand screw here. Don't think this is necessarily part of getting the back cover off either. Boy, it certainly goes pretty high. Does this actually unscrew? Yes, it does. But as you can see, it's really, really holding on. There's probably a trick to this that I don't realize what it is. And uh, I'm just gonna keep taking screws out. This, the handle here has two big screws holding it in, which seem about the same as the ones that were on the side. So I'm gonna take those out as well. All right, there we go. The handle is removed. How about now? Oh, look at that. All right, so you had to take the handle out. <laughs> I am sure that probably had to do with nothing. So let's slide this off of here. 
There is the inside of the case and there's a date code there. It says 12 1983 1983 and this is where the kickstand went into right here. So clearly that did not need to be removed. So I'm just going to thread that back in there. Well, we're looking at the bottom of the machine. There's that foam I was talking about, and it looks like I'm gonna have to unplug the keyboard here probably before I can do too much more. So let's get that out next. There is a screw on the side right here. It's a little ground lug. The keyboard connection itself is plugged into a pin header sideways. So it looks like uh, if I just cut this zip tie here, then I'll be able to slide that off. Ah, it's like this big zip tie has been there since the eighties and I'm breaking it off. Horrible. Right there, we got vintage Radio Shack zip tie. Sorry about that, Radio Shack. Well, it looks like I misspoke. I was able to unplug that connector. It doesn't appear that I can get that off very easily. I need to remember that I have to find the little metal washer thing that was on this front panel that uh, accidentally fell off when I took that side um, button off, I guess you could call it, whatever the front panel clasps onto. I gotta say, the whole machine is pretty compact and is very sturdily built, even though the outside is all plastic. So I guess uh, I'm just gonna start taking screws off and hoping that it exposes some of its secrets, some of its inner secrets. There are a couple screws that are missing on this top cover. I don't know if that means it's because someone has already been in here at some point in the past, or maybe they just were never installed by Radio Shack. All right, I think the covers are all off on there. Aha, check it out. We have the power supply here. And there it is, the switch mode power supply inside of here. Obviously we have the CRT, there is a fan. You can't see it right now, but the CRT controller board is right there on that side. And obviously the main PCB for the entire computer is underneath all of this. So I'm just gonna unplug this stuff here to get this power supply out of the way. There it is, there's the TRS-80 Model 4P power supply. And if you look right here, there's a service sticker. I'm pretty sure that's what this is. It says right there, align and supply mod. So some kind of modification on here. Don't really see anything off the top of my head that's a modification. I see a lot of dirt. Oh, I'm actually just looking at this. I wonder if these are the mod. These things look like mods just attached on the side. Wow. But what we do have as what looks like some reefer caps right here and here. So those are gonna need to be replaced in case uh, we have any kind of noxious fumes that come out of this thing. Next up, I'm going to try to remove this back metal plate here. I think that will hold in the PCB and all that other stuff. There's a big chunky metal plate right here. That's what the handle screws into. So that just adds the extra rigidity to this thing. And it looks like there are a couple screws over here right there that I got to get out as well. Hope those are going to be not too difficult to get back in there when I'm done here. All right, that did free up this whole back panel here, which is good. I can clean it up and there's that extra plate there for strength and rigidity. All right, and at this point, there is the PCB for the motherboard. Let's get the floppy drives disconnected here. There's the floppy cable. All right, rotating this around, and I just noticed I put a scratch right in my LCD screen <laughs> from this metal here. It scratched it. I really hope I can remember how to reassemble all of this. All right, so there we go. That is free on that side. Let's turn this around. Try not to scratch my monitor worse. It's bound to happen. Little battle scars from being in close proximity to so many computers getting taken apart all the time. One thing I noticed about this computer is it does not have any facility for external floppy drives. So all the TRS-80s before this supported up to four floppy drives, zero, one, two, and three. And this one just has no external connection at all. All right, I just freed the motherboard, but unfortunately there's a bunch of cables on the bottom. I think the strategy I need here is try to take this front bezel off, the plastic bezel. Now, when I had that motherboard tilted back, you couldn't see it on the camera, but I saw a lot of bodge wires. There's some serious bodge activity going on, and it doesn't look like this is Radio Shack bodging, I don't think, because they, they seem to be kind of coming off the motherboard. They're not neatly glued down like they would be if uh, this was Radio Shack's doing. All right, take a look at this. There's the motherboard, and check out some of this bodge activity going on. There's like a, a ROM chip there with a couple bodge wires, and then these 
these ones here. Now it's the keyboard I'm trying to get unplugged and it's freaking wedged itself there. How annoying. I'm just gonna have to loosen the motherboard, I guess, off this tray. All right, come on. There's a bunch of screws around the ports here, which is good. It's for strength, that makes sense. But <laughs> this keyboard connector situation here is extremely annoying. There we go. You have to like loosen the board just to get this off. I'm not completely understanding why the keyboard connector is not even aligned with this metal plate here. So that just sort of makes it impossible to get that on and off without moving the whole motherboard like this. All right, I just found a nut here. This is obviously for that thing I took off. So we'll just stick that there. I'm trying to get these cables off down here. I have one off. It is not easy. And it's because this front panel is in the way. The keyboard is free so I can move this to safety now. What I probably have to do is put this thing back down and get those knobs off the front. It's probably these here are gonna be holding the panel on. Yep, that came off. That came off, Let's throw that in there. Maybe this will come free now. No, not quite. There's a screw right there. There's a screw down there. This thing is a pain, a pain in the butt to work on. Unfortunately, these connectors are so stuck on there they are non-latching connectors, and I have one of them off, and the others just refuse to come off. Okay, I got the video connector off. There we go. Okay, it is free. There is the motherboard. There it is. There's the last little piece to this button that I took off on the side here. And getting that back on is gonna be a pain because I'm gonna have to take the whole faceplate off, which means trying to get those screws off that are down there. Okay, so if you're taking one of these apart, do not, I repeat, do not take those buttons off the side. In case you're wondering, most of the structure here, like this part here, this is all riveted together. So there really is no way uh, to actually get to these parts here without, I assume, a super long screwdriver. It looks like there's a little cut here. So maybe with a very long Phillips, you can easily get to this screw. Uh, as for that screw down there, well, I don't even see a way that's possible to get to that. I'll have to figure that out in a moment. To get the fan off, it looks like I need to take these disk drives off. And I can tell here that some modding activity has gone on with the floppy drives. And obviously you saw on the front, the two drives aren't the same. All right, and with that fan possibly out of the way a little bit, maybe I can get down to that screw down there. <laughs> Okay, the screw is out. There it is, another one of those long ones. And now when I lift this, so there it is, there's the front panel. So now I can reattach the little button on the side here, which I took off. And there is the 4P, obviously without the disk drives or the motherboard and whatnot. These are those cables that were so difficult to unplug and uh, I guess there is a little extra length here that I could have tried to access. All right, I think at this point, so much for this being a relatively short video, just taking that thing apart has got me sweating here. So I don't know why this thing wasn't booting up properly. It could be the disk drives. It could be the motherboard. It might be the power supply is acting up. I'm gonna have to do a little bit of diagnostics. Even with Seth's handy note, uh, the machine didn't seem to want to boot at all. It just tried and then failed. And then we saw those weird characters and then we got a clock and none of that do I really understand what's going on exactly. <laughs> So at this point, I think my next step is to consult the technical manual. Probably something I should have done from the very beginning. So I'll do some reading and I'll be right back. Alrighty, I'm back and I've done some reading. <laughs> kind of wish I had done that before I dug into the machine. As Seth mentioned in his letter, this machine does in fact only have a very simple boot ROM, which is right here. As opposed to the older TRS-80s, this machine doesn't have BASIC in ROM at all. And in fact, it really just has a very simplistic boot ROM, but yet more complicated than the other machines because it has the capability of running some diagnostics, I think, basic diagnostics. It can boot from the floppy, it can boot from a hard drive, and I think it can even boot from the serial port. If you're gonna run some trs CD Model 3 software, you have to stick in a disk that contains the Model 3 ROM set, which it then loads off the diskette and then I sort of reboots again, and then it's in Model 3 mode. That ROM set is loaded into the DRAM, which is right here on this board, it has 128K, which sits at the very beginning of the address space on the computer. Now, normally on the TRCD Model 1 and 3, 
if you remember my diagnostic ROM videos, the beginning of the address space is ROM and it can't be switched out. And that's one of the reasons why that the three and the one can't run CPM because it needs to have the full 64K and switch out the ROM. So what this thing does is before it executes the ROM that's in the DRAM, it bank switches out the boot ROM. And then basically, as far as the Model 3 ROM knows, it's running out of ROM, but the reality is it's actually running out of RAM. Now I think if I read it properly in the manual, the Model 4 itself, like the regular 4, has the Model 3 ROMs on the motherboard, but it can switch those out. But basically, if you're running Model 4 specific software, it doesn't even use those ROMs on the motherboard and it just switches them out entirely and loads the entire operating system and probably like a simple BIOS into the RAM. As far as I can tell functionally, the Model 4P and the original 4 are the same. Now, in fact, this particular machine is not the Gatorade version of the 4P. And the Model 4 as well comes in a Gatorade and a non-Gatorade version. From what I understand reading the manual, the Gatorade version basically takes a bunch of these logic chips and these ICs right here are GAL or PAL chips and it combines those all into like one 40 pin dip. So there's a little bit of simplicity on the motherboard there and there might be some other changes as well. Now I'd mentioned before that the ROM here has these couple bodge wires going on. I think what's going on here is the normal ROM on this motherboard is supposed to be a 2532 and what's in here is actually a 2732, which is a 4K EEPROM. The pinout of the 2732 and the 2532 don't match exactly. So whoever installed this in here, and I mean, maybe this was done at the factory, I, I don't really know. I'm assuming that part number that's written on here is the actual part number of the regular boot ROM. Well, you have to lift a couple pins and then it's picking up uh, probably an address line over here. And I think it's picking up a voltage from over there. So it's a pretty simple mod and it does work. But yeah, this will be a normal EEPROM in here in place of the typical mask ROM. I haven't quite figured out what's going on with this bodge section, but I'm gonna leave that be for now. I don't think that's actually a problem. So I think part of my problem before is that I didn't really know how to boot this system and I was using this boot disk here to try to boot it. and It wasn't working. This may not have the ROM set on it at all. There were two disks that were in the disk drives and perhaps it was the other disk that actually had the ROM set on it and I had to boot that one first to load the ROM set and then switch over to this normal TRS-80 Model 3 TRS-DOS disk here. What I want to do first is try to power up this board on the bench. And looking at the power connector here, it's basically the same as what is used on the TRS-80 Model 3. Now I definitely have to validate that the pinout is correct before I just go plugging this in, because this power supply here generates a negative voltage, which I don't know for sure if this needs. Probably does though, because it's got the built-in serial port here, and typically serial on these older things is plus 12 and minus 12. So I wouldn't be surprised if that is absolutely used on this board. Of course, the DRAM in here is just normal 64K DRAM like on a Commodore 64. So that definitely doesn't use the minus rails like it does on the other TRS-80 models. The video output connector right here looks basically identical to the one that's on the Model 3. So I'm gonna break out the RGB to HDMI and that's how we're gonna get a video signal. So that's gonna eliminate all the potential problems that were in that case, like the CRT board or the power supply board as issues. And in fact, I'm going to use this disk drive right here, which is a five and a quarter inch disk drive that's in a CD-ROM case. And see, it has a ribbon cable there. I'll just plug that into the motherboard. And I know this drive works, so we're just gonna not even use other drives at this time. And that way I can kind of eliminate as many potential problems as possible. It is my hope that I was just screwing up the boot sequence there with those disks and that this computer actually just works perfectly and maybe the connectors need a little bit of a clean and I need to fix that cap on the power supply. So this may well be an easy fix, but let's figure that out. Okay, so this is the power connector right here. It does match the actual physical shape of the power supply on the Model 3 power supply that's right here. But what I don't know is if the actual voltages are the same. So I create a little chart here. Uh, there are four pins with the little slot, which is that part of the motherboard there. I've already marked out two, which I was able to easily test with the multimeter against one of the 74LS logic chips here. We have five volts, we have ground, but we have two other pins, which I need to figure out. Now looking at this power supply here, the five volts in the ground do match, so that's a good sign. We just need to double check the other two pins, which are gonna be minus 12 volts and positive 12 volts. So I have the service manual up here and we need to find one of the ICs that actually uses the plus 12 volts and the minus 12 volts. It's probably gonna be something on the serial port and then I can just test against those other two pins to figure out if the power supply is set up correctly. All right, here we go right here. These are the serial port outputs. Uh, U15, there's a plus 12 volts and a minus 12 volt on these buffers and 
not on the incoming ones, only on the outgoing one. So I need to find U15 on this PCB. All right, so that's U15 right there. According to the schematics, pin one is minus 12 volts. So I'll touch pin one, let's see which pin it is. It is the pin furthest to the left, on my left right now. Where's the pen? I have misplaced it. Minus 12 volts. And according to the schematics, pin 14 is plus 12 volts right there, which should be that pin right next door. Plus 12 volts. All right, so looking at this wire here, this uh, like that is how it would plug in the motherboard so it would match. So minus 12 should be this wire right here, which goes to the orange wire. And I would have made the orange wire the t uh, minus 12 volts. And I would have made the yellow wire the plus 12 volts, which does coincide with the one next door. But before I plug this in and turn it on, I'm definitely gonna double check that that's the case, just, just in case. I don't wanna reverse polarity anything accidentally. So I'm just gonna plug in the mains here. Okay, the LED came on. This power supply seems to work fine while, while there's no load. So with this connector, it would go onto the motherboard just like that. So these two pins here, we should have plus five volts. Okay, it's 5.1, that's fine. Next one over to the ground, we should have plus 12. And we do 12.3, and then we should have minus 12. And it's minus 11, but that's good enough. Considering there's no load on this, that's sort of typical. Okay, so that pretty much confirms that the pinout on here matches uh, what the Model 3 motherboard has. So I'm just gonna plug that in right there. And we're gonna grab my favorite thing, the RGB to HDMI here. And for the RGB to HDMI, I have this little adapter thing which breaks out to a pin header. It's exactly what I used on the Model 3. And right here on the schematics is J9, which is this connector right here. We have pin two as the video output, ground is 135. Six is horizontal and four is vertical. All right, and I switched OBS over. You know, this camera I use for the bench shot, it's like right in front of my vision for looking at the screen. Okay, and looking at the profiles on here, at least uh, the copy of the software I have on here, we have TRS-80 Model 3 and we have TRS-80 Model 3. I think I made the this one and I think uh, Model 3 here is one that I was using in the last video. It was one that comes with a distribution. Okay, so system is on, but no smoke has come out. Good sign, power supply is running. I heard a little tick from the speaker. So let me hook up this floppy drive and let's see if we can make it boot. Unfortunately, I don't have enough cameras to also shoot from behind me so you can see the activity on this floppy drive. This camera won't pick it up and I can't pick it up on the bench cam, but this little floppy drive in the CD-ROM case has an internal power supply. It's just a 360K double-sided floppy drive set to drive select zero. It's what I typically use on stuff like this for testing. So I'm just gonna turn that on first. Drive is on and I'm gonna plug in the power here. Let's see what happens here. Oh, there we go. The drive seeked and the light's on. So it's attempting to boot. Now this was the disk that was in the disk drive. I think it was in the second disk drive when I unpacked this thing, but it says drive zero right here. I don't think I tried this. And actually it's interesting, the um, disk drive gave up. It kind of was on for a second and then the light went off. So uh, I don't have a reset button hooked up, so we're gonna have to unplug the power and plug it back in. It's kind of primitive, but c'est la vie. Let's see what happens here. It's doing something like they're seeking activity on the disk drive. And now it's just sort of doing nothing. Oh wait, no, it's still going. Oh, I'm expecting to maybe see something on the screen. I don't know. Okay, it's still a black screen. It's kind of frustrating. Um, oh, I can plug the keyboard in, can I? No, wait, the keyboard doesn't have a reset button on it. What exactly resets this thing? There must be maybe this little uh, three pin header right there. Maybe that does the reset. Okay, there it is, three pin header reset. So pin three not connected, short pin one and two for reset. I'm gonna grab a jumper. Let's try that reset. All right, we have a jumper here. Let's try to reset this thing. All right, here we go. Did that do anything at all? Did that do anything at all? Yes, the drive is seeking again. Now it's pretty obvious, I'm very unfamiliar with how this works and I didn't read the user manual, I just read the service manual for it. And I gotta say, this entire thing about putting in a disc to load the ROMs, it's not super intuitive. And especially because it doesn't 
print anything on the screen, unless of course we don't have video output and I don't realize that. All right, so I'm on what is the video pin and very clearly on the scope, we have a video signal. So the problems with the RGB to HDMI. <laughs> Uh, this last pin here, this should be the horizontal sync. And if we zoom in here, there is the pulse. And there's the frequency right there, 15.8 kilohertz. So that's definitely uh, the horizontal pulse. And then this one right here, two over, should be vertical, which I have to zoom out to see. There we go. Frequency is, of course, blocked because I have this window too small. 59.8, so that's definitely it. Okay, so we're getting a video signal and the RGB to HDMI is not decoding it. So let me figure out what's wrong now. Well, there it is with the sync signals disconnected and clearly we're getting a video signal. Um, as soon as we plugged in vertical sync, we lost the signal. Obviously, whatever's going on, something wrong with the profile here with the RGB to HDMI. So I'm gonna fiddle around until I get a working signal out of this thing because it clearly, it's actually booted. Alrighty, well, I fiddled around with the settings on there a little bit. I honestly have no idea why the profile that was on there for the Model 3 just showed a black screen. That's pretty frustrating. Uh, but there it is, and it's looking pretty good right now. So I'm going to hit that reset with this jumper here. And let's see what happens. I have a disk in the disk drive here. Uh, no, the disk is not on the disk drive. The disk is right here. All right, so I'm going to power cycle the computer here. Um, that's weird. Why is there garbage on the screen? Let's turn it off again. Plug it back in. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if that's because the disk drive is on. Let's try that again. Sometimes the disk drive has five volts coming through it and the disk drive itself is gonna be trying to power up the motherboard. So let me turn the drive on. Let's plug this in now. Okay, there we go. Just a black screen and the drive is accessing. So I'm gonna put in this disc again, that is the boot disc, I guess. Oh, look, floppy drive is not ready. I never, I never saw that happening when the system was connected to the internal monitor. It never did this. So let's reset again. So it's going to the disc. Loading ROM image. Okay, you know what? If I saw this stuff on the screen, I would have been like going, oh, this is working fine. And I would have been able to figure it out. But we all saw what it was doing. like had weird symbols and then it had that clock and it just was acting weird. Okay, so is it done? I wanna see if it, it says after it's finished loading here, insert boot disk. Oh, wait, it literally just loaded the disk itself. <sighs> this is all very confusing. Um, I'm gonna take this out. Let's put in this, uh, this disk, which is the one I was trying to load. This is so strange. I mean, I'm assuming I unplug the power and plug it back in. Okay, yeah, obviously the system is still running <laughs> from the disk drive here. So let's turn the disk drive off. We'll turn these back on at the same time. Okay, so I have the TRS di loading ROM image again. I never saw this. I just, it's so confusing. So are both of these actual functional boot disks? Uh, I'm assuming the power supply um, yeah, okay, it's, it's it's seeking. I'm assuming the power supply that's actually in the machine because I never tested the voltages. Um, oh yeah, look, it worked as well. Okay, so I'm assuming that the power supply that's in the Model 4, the one that was there, is not working properly. Uh, something's wrong with maybe the rails, maybe the five volts low or something that was causing those unpredictable results. Maybe the 12 volts was low or it came up much later, which is why the monitor came to life all of a sudden, even though I, I tapped on the machine and it started working, that might've been completely a red herring and not actually the problem. I think a good final test is, I think this right here is a Model 4 boot disk. Let's do the old full power cycle on this thing. And let's see if this actually boots up. Okay, here we go. What's happening? Loading, oh. No ROM image. Alrighty, so let's go back to this Model 4 CPM disk. Let's see if this thing does anything. I mean, I'm assuming that the Model 4 disks don't need to have a ROM or something like that. Well, let's plug this back in. This is a really ridiculous thing. I have to turn both on and off at the same time. But let's see what happens here. So with the Model 4 disk in there, it doesn't really seem to do anything. We're just getting the old black screen again. Let me hit the reset jumper on and off. The drive is spinning. 
it's not doing anything. And uh, I think the light's going to go off. Okay, the light goes off. Well, it's really cool to see that Model 3 software at least is working on this motherboard. That means that the problem lies elsewhere, like I had just said. I'm not totally sure why it's not running Model 4 software though. Like the whole thing about the Model 4P is it's fully compatible with the Model 4, which means that CPM and all that other AD column software that exists for it should work, and yet doesn't seem to be working. Although actually, I just had a thought. What if the problem is the RGBD HDMI again malfunctioning, and when it switches to 80 columns mode, which it would, putting that CPM disc, perhaps it just blanks the screen. I don't think that's actually the case because it didn't seem to be actually accessing the disk drive at all. And I'm sure loading CPM or that other disk I have would have at least done something on here. I think I'm gonna end this video here. And in the meantime, between this one and the next, I'm definitely gonna take a look at the user manual for the 4P just to see what it specifically says about loading four software. Maybe there's an extra disk that I don't have that has some kind of four ROMs on it that I need to load or maybe there's just something I'm missing. I'm not totally sure there. So if you have ideas about that, definitely put that down below in the comment section. I'd love to read up what I'm doing wrong on this thing. In the next video, I'll dig into the power supply and the analog board on that machine. I'm pointing over there because it's sitting on the floor. <laughs> and uh, we'll see what's going on there because clearly this machine was misbehaving with that power supply. When with this one, well, as we can see here, it just loaded right up. And that's with both of these disks. So I know the disk I had in there should have worked. Oh, and of course, I'll do testing on those floppy drives as well, which are standard SugarArt drives, so I can test them on PC using IMD like I test all my normal disk drives. Now onto a little other business here. I recorded the beginning of this video last week, and I'm recording the second video now after I attended VCF Midwest number 17. That was in Chicago, and I met a ton of fans and patrons there. It was absolutely a fantastic experience. Really my first VCF show uh, with the channels being as big as they are. I attended VCF in the Seattle, I don't know, it was a few years ago, but my channels were a lot smaller then. And that particular VCF is also a lot smaller. So this time it was just amazing to meet tons of people. And of course I met other YouTubers and all sorts of people from the retro community. It was an absolute blast. So if you came up and talked to me, Thank you very much for saying all those kind words that everyone did. And if you did go and you couldn't talk to me because there were lines or I was busy or I wasn't there, I do apologize and I'll be going to more VCFs in the future. But yeah, what an amazing experience. Thank you to all the people who put that show on. You all put in so much hard work to make an amazing, amazing show. So I think I'm gonna end this video here. I wanna get this one out for Septandi. I will try to get to the next part of this video and put the machine back together in part two, which maybe it'll be next week, but I have some other videos I wanna make as well, so I can't promise that uh, there'll be another TRS-80 video coming up right away. I know people have been saying that they love TRS-80 videos, but at VCF, I had people come up to me saying that they love Commodore 64 videos as well, and Apple II videos, and when am I gonna do Atario videos, and all sorts of stuff. You know, you can't please everyone all the time, but I like to kind of mix it up on this channel a little bit, and I have some other videos in the pipeline, so. Anyhow, that is gonna be that. If you like this video, Comment down below, thumbs up, you know, all that usual stuff. You know what to do if you don't like it too. Hit that subscribe if you haven't already. Check out the second channel if you haven't already. A huge thanks to all my patrons for all the support that you're giving me on the channel. Really appreciate it. Their names, they're scrolling up the side of the screen. And I guess that is gonna be that. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.